Hi everyone, welcome back to ESG Decoded. I'm your host today, Caitlin Allen, and I am welcoming Robin Farricone, the CEO of Farian Advisors to our podcast today. Robin, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, thanks Caitlin. I'm so excited because this topic of um, executive compensation, why it matters, uh, why it matters for good governance is so rich. And Robin is actually literally wrote the book on this, <laughs> which I'll get to in a second. Just a little bit of background um, on Robin herself. Um, as the CEO and founder of Faring Advisors, Robin has led the strategic development and expansion of the executive compensation performance and corporate governance advisory firm for a number of years. With over 30 years of consulting experience, Robin advises clients on business and talent strategies, executive compensation, organization value management, and performance measurement. She's the author of this book. If you're um, on video, you can see that I'm holding it in my hands. <laughs> the book is called Fair Pay, Fair Play. Aligning Executive Performance in Pay. So excited to have um, the person here who's really one of the top experts on this issue to discuss, because this is, like I said, such a rich topic. Let me start with just asking you a little bit more about Farian Advisors to get to know kind of your day-to-day -day and your areas of focus. And then we're going to jump right into the big question, which is why does executive compensation matter for governance? Great, Caitlin. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so what Varian Advisors does is we um, consult on matters of executive compensation, performance measurement, um, and corporate governance at the board level. And we're usually reporting to compensation committees. Now they go by a number of different names, which we could discuss a little later. But we're usually consulting to compensation committees, uh, often working with management to help define how should incentives be designed. And it's not just a question of how much should people get paid, but how should they get get paid? And so that's what we're uh, we're looking to do when we're consulting with our clients. Let's just go to the root of the conversation here today uh, to get us started. Why does executive compensation matter? So you're right, Caitlin. Executive compensation is kind of an emotionally loaded term. <laughs> And so, um, because it has a lot of meaning for people, um, but it's really important uh, to investors that boards and companies get it right. And boards are working on behalf of the investors. Um, they're, the inv they're the agents, if you will, um, for the investors to make sure executive compensation is right. Because for large companies, you, you can't negotiate with each investor. It's an arm, you know, it has to be, um, arm's length and it has to be independently determined. And so that's the function boards are playing. So as they play that function, investors want to make sure that uh, companies have taken up a, a balanced and considered view of it and a rational view um, in setting executive compensation and that they are aligning that compensation with the investor's interests. So that's what's so important about it. And when it goes off the rails, it's when investors think that those things are not happening and there's a lot of disclosure around executive compensation that's required. And when investors look at that disclosure and they see that there's abuses and things not happening uh, that would be in their view in the realm of quick governance, they start to say, this is a window into the boardroom. What else is going wrong in governance? What else am I missing here? What is this company up to? And so, Executive compensation is not only important to get right in and of itself, but it's a window into the boardroom about corporate governance in general. According to, you know, you've done incredible amounts of research on this, you and your team, um, that shows up in your book, in reports. Um, I know that you're a frequent contributor to um, Forbes and other publications. What, in your view, are the major trends in corporate governance as it pertains to compensation? And so sort of what's on the mind of these compensation committees, or perhaps they have another name at the board, uh, what's kind of the top trends and what's on their minds nowadays? Yeah, so the major trends um, are kind of interesting. 
two come to mind that are perennial favorites. In other words, we can say that they're trans, but they've been trans for 10 years and they've been extremely relevant. One is the one that's the subject of my book, which is uh, pay and performance alignment. Uh, it is really important what we mean by that, that executive interests are aligned with shareholder interests. And I define alignment as being essentially when the pay is reasonable for the size of the company, the industry it's in, and the performance it delivers, and that pay is sensitive to performance. That's essentially pay and performance alignment in my view. And that definition has stayed the same. What's interesting is the folks who advise investors on how to vote their proxies, so how to vote on pay, um, will look at pay and performance alignment and they will decide if pay and performance is aligned or not. And so that's a perennial favorite. Um, so it's a trend, but also a, a long-term hallmark of good executive compensation. The second one is what I'll call strategic alignment. As companies are updating their strategies and changing their strategies, there's a lot of transformation going on in the world today. Uh, it's really important that compensation support the strategic change and not get in the way of it. And so, for example, we just um, worked with a client last year. They're going through a major strategic transformation. We had to reevaluate all of their compensation systems to make sure that they uh, supported that transformation. And guess what? We found that they didn't. And so well, there was a lot of change involved um, that those systems had to be changed for this year so that uh, we made sure that the, the support was there. So that's, that's an example of strategic alignment. Other trends that we're seeing are that there's still a fair amount of emphasis on retaining top talent. And we should talk more about this maybe a little later, but there's this tug of war between, you know, good governance, getting the quantum or amounts of pay right versus retaining that talent and paying more than what the market might dictate just to make sure that person stays in the seat. So uh, retaining top talent is another big trend that is um, continues. And then environmental, social, and governance, ESG, and ESG Decoded is the name of your, your podcast, and that is an extremely important topic and a broad topic that's still evolving, so we can talk more about that. Finally, I would say compensation committees have are not compensation committees anymore. They are compensation and human resource committees or compensation and leadership development committees. Um, they're, they've renamed themselves to recognize that they have a broader charter. And so making sure that the conversations and the agendas of the meetings geared to that broader charter is, uh, is definitely a trend that we're seeing. I think that last one is so interesting. Um, several of our clients have also renamed committees for Climco would be more on the environmental side and um, say climate related risk and that sort of thing. I have not touched the compensation side as much in my own career. Um, so this is really interesting to me with compensation committees uh, broadening their charters, right? What does that really mean? Like, how is that playing out in the boardroom? Are the conversations changing? Is it new topics? Is it just kind of a new take on old topics? Um, is it, what does it really look like from the inside? Yeah, uh, it's such an interesting um, area because if you go back, way back to the old days, and I mean to the early 2000s, uh, the big topic for executive compensation committees tended to be how are we paying the top five? And that was just statutorily required, and they would meet the minimum statutory requirements. Now, investors are looking at the sustainability of a corporation, and they're very interested in the health of the workforce and whether that workforce is treated well or whether they are abused and kind of loose in the saddle all the time, because that's a less sustainable position to be in. You know, while we used to have the statutory top five be the topic of conversation, now the topic of conversations have broadened very considerably. So not only are comp committees looking at executive comp strategy and pay levels, plan design, pay practices and policies, like do I ask my leadership to own stock in the company, those kind of things. But they're also very much integrating with finance. What are the goals and the performance requirements that are associated with those incentive plans? So I make sure that if somebody's going to 
earn pay, they, they earn it for the right performance level. How do I think about broad-based compensation? So what I mean by that is not only am I thinking about compensation at the top, but what are we doing down the line? Are we trying to provide equity down the line for people so that there's an identification more of the of the workers with the company? Am I supporting people with benefit programs that really help with well-being more broadly? And it's these kind of things that are getting to that sustainability issue I talked about a moment ago that investors are looking for. One of the topics that I think is really consuming time and mind share of, comp and I call them compensation committees for shorthand, but they're, again, they're really not just compensation committees anymore. But one of the big topics is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, because they want to make sure, the committees want to make sure that the companies really have an inclusive workforce, that people feel like they belong there. Why is that? It's because they're going to have access to better and broader talent as they fight the war for talent um, if they do that. And they're also going to have a higher probability of keeping people if people feel like they fit in, they belong, uh, they're accepted. And it's going to make for a better environment where people also feel like they can speak up. They can bring new ideas to the table. They can be themselves. They can contribute in ways that they might not have felt comfortable contributing in the past. And these are all things that contribute to the long-term performance of an organization. So what's happened in the boardroom is that the discussions have changed, the agendas have changed. So at the beginning of a year, a committee might put together an agenda for the whole year and say at this meeting, we're gonna talk about this and at the next meeting, we're gonna talk about that. Well, these agendas are now including things like workforce well-being, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion succession and talent planning, things that are broader than just executive compensation. And so the conversations, the presentations, the mind share, and, you know, the connecting of the dots of one thing to the other, it is, uh, it is, is really taking precedence now compared to the way it used to be. So it kind of relates to this other topic of shareholder engagement. So what do you see as the responsibilities of a compensation committee when it comes to communicating with shareholders about compensation and corporate governance more broadly? Yeah, so shareholder engagement, um, what we mean by that is where companies actually talk directly with their investors and engage with those investors to find out what's on their minds and for investors to discover from the company what the company is doing about those things. One of the biggest topics that keeps being brought up in these engagement sessions is the topic of ESG. Does that company have an ESG strategy? How defined is it? And does it link to incentives? If it does, they have clear expectations around that. And if it doesn't, they might want to know why. But that's a very big topic. And it's been clear to us over time then investors want to hear from the boards. They want to hear from the boards. Uh, it, you know, it's nice to hear from the executives, but they want to know that the boards are tracking with these ideas and that the boards are actually involved and know what they're talking about. They know how the comp systems work. They know how the ESG strategies are designed. They know whether it links to compensation or not and why. And they can very articulately talk about what might be on investor minds. And therefore, they're kind of validating that the boards are, in fact, effective agents of the investor. And that's part of that engagement strategy. So my view is it's really important for comp committees and, and board members, maybe more generally, uh, to be involved in these engagement sessions. Um, and one example, which sticks in my mind, is we had one very large client who had a lead independent director. And that lead independent director flew around to the major investors and had in-person meetings with those investors, probably at 20 meetings in a season. And that was just a huge effort on that person's part to engage with the, with the investor, understand what was on their minds, and uh, to be able to address that and on behalf of the company. And that's the kind of effort not, that not every company has to do, but it's the kind of effort that invest, you know, impress investors. That's really interesting. You know, I've heard from board members too, that's such a fine line of 
you know, being a board member and and being a consultant, <laughs> which I guess in shareholder engagement is different than consulting, of course. But um, I know that that's a, a fine line for a lot of people trying to, to, to walk. Is this a growing trend? Do you see more boards engaging more directly with, with um, shareholders? So I do see that when, when it's very, very interesting. Most companies will reach out to their major investors and say, we would be very happy to have a conversation with you about whatever it is that's on your mind, whatever it is we've put in our proxy, so that these disclosures, if you have any questions, we can answer those and, and we can address what we're doing more broadly. Um, so they will offer that to investors. And if the investor says, yes, I'd love, love to speak to you about it, then very often, probably more often than not, a board member is involved in that conversation these days. But more and more investors are saying, no, the proxy disclosures were clear. We got it. Um, your website's clear. We get what you're doing. We really don't have concerns that rise to the level of us needing to engage with you. And so investors are kind of creating this dichotomy between yes, we'd like to talk to you, or we really don't need to talk with you. I always tell my clients that if they say, we really don't need to talk with you, that's a great sign. They're satisfied. They're happy with what they have found out about the company. It doesn't mean a bad thing if they want to talk to you, but if they say they don't want to talk to you, that usually means a good thing. I want to come back to something you brought up, which is um, linking E, S, or G factors to, to pay. I know your recent report, so um, the sixth annual report by Ferriant and your partners, the 2023 Global Trends and Stakeholder Incentives, the Staying Power of ESG is the title of your report. It was launched um, this year. We will include the link to that in the uh, episode notes. Um, but one of the interesting findings of that report is that more than three-fourths of large companies now incorporate what we're broadly calling stakeholder measures into their incentive plans. Um, that's up five percentage points compared to 2021 and 14 percentage points compared to 2020. So really interesting finding, um, very obvious change, very, you know, big numbers, five and 14 percentage points. So um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that trend, why you think that's happening, and then maybe some good examples in your mind of stakeholder measures, for example, that, that work or seem to be working well for companies. Yeah. So Caitlin, let's um, first of all, take kind of the broad trends. First of all, we do see an increase in the use of these measures, um, as you mentioned. And what's interesting is that the U.S. is kind of in the middle of the pack. We've, we've looked at these statistics globally. And what's interesting is that we're not the front runners. Europe tends to be uh, that have more prevalence, as does Australia. So European and Australian companies have more prevalence in knitting together ESG into their plans with executive compensation. That's one interesting thing, but the trend is clearly up in that regard. The other thing kind of interesting is that more and more of these measures are, are quantified. Um, investors are asking for quantification, but companies get better and better all the time at measuring how well they're doing on their goals. And so the quantification of the metrics is another piece. And usually people are tying, let's say 20% of a short-term incentive plan to ESG type metrics as part of their reward system. Also been interesting is that DEI measures are still the, are the most prevalent. In other words, if we look across all the kinds of measures of ESG, whether it be greenhouse gas emissions, water usage on the environmental side, for example, on the social side, employee engagement scores, DEI metrics in terms of uh, population representation. DEI is clearly the, the most prevalent measure. But what's really interesting and what really came out in this last report is that environmental measures are really coming into their own. It used to be minority of companies and mostly in the energy area would uh, use environmental measures as in, in their incentives. But now we see much broader application of that. It's approaching 50% of companies when they use ESG measures in their incentives are using environmental measures. So that's, that's a big trend. The other big trend is that, you know, you have to walk before you run on these things. And most companies started out by measuring 
ESG measures in their short-term incentive programs. These are programs that measure performance a year at a time. But more and more companies are saying, well, now that we're more confident in how we're measuring performance, these measures are really long-term. It's hard to change our greenhouse gas emissions. It's hard to change our employee representation in a company. And so we're measuring these measures over the longer term in our long-term plans, not just in the short term. These are extremely um, interesting trends. And one example is Starbucks, very visible company. They really leaned into ESG metrics a couple of years ago, putting them into their incentive plans. And they do have a long-term incentive measure that is a DEI measure, uh, diversity measure, that gears to the improvement in, in Black, Indigenous, and Lat Latinx uh, representation at the manager level. And so what they're doing is they're saying, if we improve, we will get incentives for value from that. And if we don't improve or fall backwards, uh, we're actually going to get penalized for it. And so um, this is a company that's kind of putting their money where their mouth is in terms of long-term ESG metrics. Um, and it's, I think it's a very visible example that's of interest to all of us. That is really interesting. I think sometimes as well, um, just an example from the energy industry, several companies in that space have um, tied a zero routine flaring. So um, flaring being the process it happens at the oil field and it's a large source of, of methane. But of course, you're also burning a, a resource that is valuable. Um, one of the World Economic Forum's say goals that they had for the sector uh, was that by, and I can't remember the original date that World Economic Forum put out, but basically one of them was let's have zero routine flaring. Meaning sometimes you have to do it for safety, right? You don't want to cause an explosion or whatever. But in terms of a routine, like just this one is on every day, getting to zero. And a lot of companies thought might maybe that was hard. You know, um, we have to do this because we don't have the gathering systems or there's lots of reasons, you know, that you might not be able to do that. Um, but once it was tied to executive compensation, they figured out real fast, <laughs> like within a year, figured out how to do it. And it wasn't that hard. <laughs> so I think sometimes um, it's that incentive that that helps prioritize, right? Because there's so many things that a company can be doing um, when it comes to environmental, social issues. You know, A, you want it to be a good value for the company. So the other good thing about zero routine flaring is you're capturing the value of that <laughs> gas that would otherwise you wouldn't be making money on. There's a reason it's that extra push from the compensation plan that really helps companies to prioritize. And I think that's one of the challenges our clients have, right, is when you do your materiality assessment, you look at all of these issues, it can, be, can feel overwhelming. Wow, there's so many things we've got to work on. But when you tie something to pay, it's like, okay, I might hear in this big strategy, but I know in my department, in my operations, in what whatever part of the business I work in, I know really, really where I'm supposed to prioritize. It's a very effective way to make progress on, on your goals. There's a lot of what you said in there that's, uh, I think, really interesting. Um, one is the idea that improving on some of these measures really has value. And we talked about the value of DEI a little earlier. You just talked about the value of certain environmental improvement metrics. And I think the philosophy that people really need to get their arms around is that excellence in ESG and shareholder wealth actually do go hand in hand. They're not mutually exclusive. It's not a zero sum game. If you improve on these metrics, you often will improve shareholder wealth. And so they go hand in hand. And that's why investors are interested in them. They're looking again at the sustainability of uh, cash flows and ESG actually helps them measure that. So that's kind of point one there that's really interesting. The other is the question of prioritization. And I do think, you know, a lot of companies started out by putting broader scorecards out there around ESG, and that was a little too diffu diffuse. They also um, would measure ESG more at the individual le level. You know, did somebody show up in a respectful way around DEI issues and things of that nature, you know, but what they found is that those don't 
communicate corporate priorities and they uh, are hard to scale. So more and more companies are putting these measures into corporate measures that everyone has to rally around. People may have different impact on those measures, but they really need to embrace them culturally and, and rally around them. And I think that's a really important thing. They're becoming more visible and then you have to prioritize. If it's a laundry list, it won't really get any focus. So that is um, kind of the second piece. The third piece is investors have basically said, large investors, a lot of them have said, look, you have to have an ESG strategy. You don't necessarily have to put ESG metrics into your incentive plans. But if you do, we definitely want those metrics to come up to certain standards. One is we want to make sure that they are directly relevant to the company's business model. So that again, kind of sets us up for prioritization. Number two, they want to make sure that they're quantified. So you talked about the quantifying of the, of the flaring earlier. And I think that's really important because if you have a metric that is not quantified, it's very qualitative, that may be um, a reasonable way to start out. But over the long term, it's more effective if you can measure and quantify how well companies are doing. The third one is they don't want it to be a fudge factor. They don't want it just to be a plug number to say, okay, we didn't make it on the financial performance, but now we're going to make it on the ESG performance. They definitely don't want that. They want it to be its own measurement that has its own integrity attached to it. And so, for example, when you see some of these measures that are out there, like the Starbucks one I mentioned, they're tied to metrics. They have a no change in the um, prevent in their diverse population at the management level, then that no change translates into a penalty for the award. Uh, if they have a positive change, then it, yeah, but it's small, it might not affect the award. And it's only with larger increases that are defined, 5% increase or more, that that will have a 10% impact on the award. So they really are trying to quantify things more and investors are asking for that. It's a very important part of the journey that people are on to try to have these measures be useful, honed, and meaningful to the population that operate under them. Robin, I'm thinking about your clients, sort of your day-to-day. -day. I know this is a complex subject, so if it's if I'm asking you to simplify too much, then just tell me now. But I'm wondering if you have sort of a, you know, here's what to do or a few things to say about here's what not to do right like what have you seen that's just like absolutely don't do this <laughs> doesn't work or um kind of your top definitely do this definitely don't do that is there do you have any anything simple like that for folks to 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 think as a quick reference or is it we just do, too complex? Yeah. do no, you there, it is it there are definitely kind of rules of thumb let's put it that okay. way okay. um what is people have recognized that they need to walk before they run. So as I mentioned earlier, which is that you can start by figuring out where the priorities are, how to measure performance against those priorities. And a lot of companies have realized that it's hard to measure things like diversity. You know, how do we put people into different ethnic or gender categories? How global do we go with that measurement? Or is it US based? What if it differs by business unit or level? And this are how do we get the data? How do we make sure it's accurate if we're going to report on it, particularly in filed public documents? So uh, we basically encourage our clients to, to maybe pilot these measures first. Um, a, they should link to the strategy, but B, how do you measure them and what kind of pilot can you set up to make sure that they are measurable, that they have integrity, and that you're not putting people's pay at risk in a way that is, is going to end up being dysfunctional in the long run. It's gotta, it's gotta resonate and it's gotta have integrity for people. So that's probably the main thing. And then once you do it, it's to prioritize, to not have the laundry list and to quantify to the extent that, you know, you've piloted, you've got your priorities and you can do that. That's really the way to go into it. Uh, we actually put out a database now and we've been doing this for the last two, three years uh, because DEI is still the most prevalent measure around what the S&P 500 companies are doing specifically with their DEI measures, both in their short-term and in their long-term incentive plans. And that's really interesting because we're able to see the progression of companies, not just what if they're doing this year, but what did they do last year? How did it change? How did it progress? And where are they headed with it? Because it is a journey.
you know, those are the to do's here and to getting it right. The last thing I'll say is if these measures are in the shorter term incentive plans, it's okay to change them. They need to stay contemporary with what the emphasis is on the, you know, of the company and what the priorities are in the strategic plan. So if you're going through a major transformation, again, looking at the ESG measures is really important. And we just had a client who changed their ESG measures and they decided that cybersecurity was really important. And they figured out how to measure that and then put that into the system. So it's those kind of things that I think uh, become really relevant, important, and measurable. Uh, and we say those are the to-dos. And the don'ts are just the opposite side of that. You know, jumping in with both feet before you know what you're doing, that's probably not a great idea. <laughs> Amazing how it seems like such such straightforward advice, but it, it happens a lot, <laughs> especially on the ESG side. Oh, very good. Very good. This has just been a wonderful conversation. I know our audience, especially the professionals in our audience that are sitting in these organizations um, and perhaps on the boards as well, um, will we'll get a lot of value out of this, Robin. Was there anything you wanted to bring up that we haven't touched upon? Yeah, I think... The one thing that tends to be on board's mind is um, how do you retain top talent in an environment where there are standards of good governance? It's like you want pay and performance to be aligned. You want it to be reasonable for the things I talked about, the size of the company, the industry, and the performance. But you also need to retain people, so you need to do special things for people, which tends not to be favored by proxy advisors and investors. and I think there's some rules of thumb there. We are seeing with the economy uh, kind of uh, teetering a little bit, we're seeing uh, companies being really ju judicious about how to retain people. They're being selective about who gets retention awards. They're making sure the quantums are reasonable. Uh, they're designing them differently for a different purpose than their normal incentive plans. So while my normal incentive plan might have a a long-term plan might have a three-year vesting associated with it, a three-year measurement period in vesting. Possibly my retention award might have a four-year vesting or something that, that does something a little differently. And then they're explaining it very explicitly in the proxy to investors why they had to take this action or why they thought this action was important to protect the, uh, the brain trust of the organization, the most critical people. So those are the kind of things that are happening, and it's the ways that companies can stay within the realm of good governance, but still do what they have to do to retain talent and, and walk that tightrope between, you know, navigate that collision course between retention and good governance. And I think that's still alive and well. It was a big deal in the last, in the last year or two, and even with uh, today's economy faltering and companies laying off people, um, it's still important to do to do it in the really in the right way, and it's still kind of alive and well. So I think that's a another thing that's on minds, and it goes to the issue of good governance, which is how we started out this conversation. Absolutely, I think your research and your work is so important, especially for folks that are curious about sort of numbers and the trends. And your book is filled with amazing charts that really help drive a lot of this home, but. Um, I think for me, my takeaway here is that this is this is a lot of art, um, but there is a science behind it. I fully recognize this is there's a lot of art to this, but yeah, the work that you've done is just um, really fantastic for guidance for the folks that are sitting in these seats. And and one does try to get a holistic picture of things. It's not just one thing or another. It really is. How did you paint? It all adds up to a holistic picture. That is a combination of art and science. And what does that look like? And that's what investors are looking at. They're saying, how does this all add up for me? Absolutely. Well, Robin, thank you so much for being here today. I think it's such an important topic and we don't talk about it enough on ESG Decoded. So really, really happy you were able to join us. Thank you My so much. My pleasure, Caitlin. Thank you so much for having me today. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely.